Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Neosystems CMMC Town Hall. Now I'd like to introduce your host, Ed Bassett from Neosystems. Ed? Thank you, Don, and welcome, everyone, to our continuing series of Town Hall Ask Me Anything sessions on Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, or CMMC. I uh, want to mention my guest today, Jerry Leishman. I also want to mention that we are recording these sessions as part of our community outreach to the Defense Industrial Base. Um, additionally, our resident artist, Wade Forbes, you'll see on the screen, is uh, sketch noting the session. And we will send out that sketch as a um, capture of this, this discussion to our audience after the event. Our focus at Neosystems as a managed service provider is on organizations that are seeking certification under CMC. And that's primarily who we have in our audience here today. Please do send in questions on the Q&A feature within Zoom, and I'll try to work those into my conversation with Jerry as, as time allows. I'll start with introduction of Jerry Leishman. He is the Executive Vice President and National Security and Compliance Director at the CORTAC Group, where he provides advisory services to the DOD supply chain on compliance with federal cybersecurity requirements. Jerry's background is in cloud services, IT service management, and GRC, building on a 13-year stint at Microsoft. Jerry, thanks for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. It's great to be back, Ed. So you've uh, you've been on this program before. The last time you joined us was just before the CMMC 2.0 um, documents came out, and things were kind of quiet in the world of CMMC at that at that time. But a lot has happened in the last few months. Uh, right now, I would say things are pretty lively. There's been a sort of a rapid rapid pace of change and things to absorb and and, and digest. Um, as as you watch these recent changes coming out to the CMMC program and from DOD, what do you see as kind of most significant in terms of its impact on the defense industrial base? Well, that's a great, great question. You know, we sat for, gosh, a year, year and a half on CMMC 1.0, and we all worked hard to get ready for it. And then it just went quiet from, uh, you know, the DOD. So we all began to wonder. And then last November 2.0 came out with some significant changes, uh, you know, removing, you know, the practices from the level three or actually changing the model from five levels to three levels, that's significant. Removing the, the additional 20 delta um, practice areas above NIST 800-171, which is kind of the baseline today for the DFARS slowdown and loss and what people need to be meeting today. Um, so those are two significant things. And then from the assessment standpoint, um, you know, everybody was going to get audited, both level one, two, three, four, and five. And uh, with the change, suddenly we have auditors that don't have requirements. So how do you assess it? So it, it's it's a big bottleneck for industry to prepare for uh, assessing the suppliers that will need to be ass, uh, uh, assessed by a third party. And that's still to be determined who is actually going to be uh, required to be assessed by third parties versus moving to more of a self-assessment model. Um, and even uh, the last DOD uh, presentation about CMMC, as CMMC is, the ownership has moved over to the DID, DOD CIO. That's a change in the entire dynamics and the execution of what CMMC 2.0 is going to look like. So with all of that change, it seems like there's still a lot of chaos going on. And a lot of people are not sure to proceed, to not proceed. But I, I really want to emphasize that all the changes are actually accelerating the, uh, the requirements for, for all levels of suppliers in the defense industrial base. And primarily because they're, they're turning it into a federal regulation, CFR 32 and 48, which will make CMC 2.0 actually a, a legal program. And the, the requirements uh, will also be um, put into the federal register, which means that it's law. Um, and the other important thing is, is CMMC 1.0 was tied to contracts over a five-year rollout. So if you didn't have a contract that had a CMMC requirement for five years, you had five years to wait. But with the new rule changes, it affects everybody immediately. So if you're going to either have to self-attest or have a third party assess your environment, depending on what level of CMMC 2.0 you're at. And so the velocity of those assessments and requirements is still to be determined because it does, still depends on the third party auditors, but uh, it's not tied to contracts anymore over a five year rollout. It's effective immediately with the rule changes, which means everybody all at once is now going to be impacted. So that's the real highlight that I wanna make is that it's actually accelerated it for everybody based on the rulemaking process, which is currently in in flux, we don't have a date when that will be done, and then we don't know how long the 
the rural feedback will be provided for public comment, but it's it could be six months, it could be 12 months, but once that's done, it will become law and everybody will have to move forward with it all together. Um, so there's no, you shouldn't be waiting. It's actually accelerating. Um, and, um, you know, you, you might have to do more self test session, but it might still have a third party audit. It just still depends. We just don't know the details. But once the DOD finalizes the rulemaking, we'll have all the details and then we can actually um, be prescriptive in terms of our training, in terms of, you know, uh, assessment uh, approach, third or a third party or self attestation. But in any case, it's all going to wrap around NIST 800 171 for the level two, which is you carry CUI or ITAR data. If you're carrying FCI data, you'll be a level one. So you'll most likely be self attesting against the FAR 52 and providing a SPUR score to the DOD. So at the end of the day, the DOD is getting everybody accountable for doing the work and reporting it to the DOD. So the if there are issues, they have the ability to apply the False Claims Act. Say, hey, you didn't give us the truth, you weren't transparent for everybody in the defense industrial base. And then they'll take appropriate enforcement actions from that. And that's the other big stick the DOD is bringing down to help people, encourage them to move forward. Um, so I know that was a lot to dump, but there's still a lot of moving parts and it's accelerating and you should get started now. So that would kind of be the yeah. summary of it. The, the, the latest thing we've seen from DOD, so you mentioned the move to DOD CIO. As a result of that move, they've been doing a roadshow of sorts. They've had a series of town hall meetings. Um, I think the third one is tomorrow, maybe, is that? Yes, tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yeah. So they've done, they've done three town halls, all with the same content. So anybody who hasn't uh, checked that out, it's on the DOD CIO's website, or you can attend live, uh, you can attend live and ask questions tomorrow in that event. And that um, they, what they've been doing there is really showcasing a lot of the, the new guidance on CMOC 2.0, but also showcasing tools and things that can assist. So they've got NSA and BC3 and other folks on there talking about some of the things that they're doing within the department to provide support to the defense industrial base as we, as we wrestle with this. So as far as learning about the DOD, available DOD resources, uh, anybody who hasn't been to those town halls, we don't like to advertise other people's town halls, but this is the government. So um, they are um, next. Yeah, tomorrow morning, is, as Jerry mentioned, I don't know if we can get the link up in the in the chat here because because I'm multitasking too much on this call. But um, but anyway, keep an eye out for that or, or go to DOD CIO website to yeah. see. Your, to see your hey, and I'd like to add just a comment on that. You know, you know, CMC 1.0 is under the procurement organization, the DOD which didn't have responsibilities for other cybersecurity areas are about procurement of contracts. As this CMMC 2.0 has moved over to the DOD CIO, they have other programs that are focused on cybersecurity, ransomware, other things around data protection for the DOD. So what I am expecting, they're going to be combining all of that expertise into CMMC 2.0 and ransomware. And so it's going to be a continually evolving cybersecurity program you know, driven by Siemens, CMMC 2.0, but tied in with other sorts of tools and capabilities. So it's really an integrated approach to data protection for DOD suppliers. Um, so I think it's a good place to be from a holistic standpoint. So you don't have two organizations telling you to do different things. Good. So um, bringing this kind of the, some of these new developments around to what you're doing at, at Cortac Group, you help people chart their path to compliance, help them make smart choices. It's a complicated marketplace. The marketplace is complicated. The requirements are complicated. So as, as you're talking to businesses, what do you see as kind of their most significant challenges? I mean, you mentioned a minute ago, you know, don't wait, right? So analysis paralysis, obviously that can be a big challenge or people don't know how to move or, or want to move. But in terms of things that are, that are causing people to not take action or, or tripping them up, what do you see as those big challenges? Yeah, you know, so Cortec, we're on the business advisory side. We're not a managed service provider like yourself, Ed, or, you know, services mon monitoring the um, uh, the SIMS. What we are is it's like an attorney for a company where it's helping them, an organization, navigate an area where they don't have a lot of expertise. So just take, hey, this company wants to climb or somebody wants to climb Mount uh, Rainier here in the Northwest. It's hard to do by yourself. Right, you got to carry a lot of equipment. You got to carry food. You got to know the right path. It's pretty risky. So what we try to do is be the uh, the guide advisor 
for a particular organization say, hey, you really need to think about going this path or, you know, here's some learnings we've had that we bring to you. This is the right equipment. This is the right MSP to host, host your data and protect the data. Um, and then, you know, here's the policies and procedures that you really need. So it's really an aggregation of, uh, of a village of people and resources so they can be successful in climbing that mountain. And so we're trying to kind of be that fabric or the glue to help them navigate the journey, advocate for them on the right products, and then, you know, help them get there and then stay compliant as the, uh, the regulations and, the, and their contracts require. So that's where we're at. So what we're seeing in the marketplace, um, you know, the, uh, for the small companies, the money is still an issue to invest in cybersecurity. So I think we're seeing more folks sit on, sit and wait until new grants come out from the DOD through the RMEPs. They can kind of make progress on an incremental basis up funded by the DOD because they just don't have the disposable income. However, that prevents them from moving forward because they just don't have the money. Um, so it's a kind of a wait and see for the small to medium sized businesses, which isn't good for industry, but that's kind of the reality of the marketplace. For companies that are medium to large that have already existing uh, compliance programs or cybersecurity sort of resources, they're looking to fill those gaps with somebody and organizations that can help them through the whole journey, not just one step on the journey, but be there writing uh, as a guide all the way through. But you know that takes investment and leadership uh, to make that decision that we're all into this. We understand cybersecurity is important from just a ransomware standpoint, as well as our contractual risk of losing contracts if we don't do this for the DOD. Um, you know, you can even take critical infrastructure from public safety. We've all seen it that, uh, you know, NIST 800-171 is becoming the new baseline for all industries to, uh, to achieve just to prevent from ransomware. And that's not even, that's just a starting point and data protection. Um, but the small, the medium, the big ones see that it's writing on the wall and they're able to invest in it and move forward. Um, so that's a divergence I'm seeing in the defense industrial base. You know, those that have the money to move forward, they want to, but they don't have the skills or the money to do it. The other ones are, yeah, they got to do this, but it's budgeted money. We got to move forward just like we did with ISO 27001. Now we got to do this for CMMC. It's just part of their businesses. And it's less emotional since it's a budget in a company where small businesses spending any money is emotional for the CEO and the owner. So how we bridge that to, um, help the smaller companies move forward and secure their supply chain is still a question um, that needs to be um, resolved and funded from the DOD or through contractual, or they've even talked about giving some sort of incentive to companies to be early adopters and give them a competitive advantage on you know, government contracts. Still, that's hearsay. They talked about it, but there's no details in that. So that's kind of the, the gist of the marketplace uh, that I'm seeing from a, from a um, a supplier standpoint. So CMC 2.0, one of the, as the government announced it in November, they talked about it streamlining, adding some trust, you know, trusting the contractors more. They talked about, um, they talked about the notion that it was going to make it in theory cheaper, right? So to address the yeah. cost issue that you mentioned, right? The idea being that um, by getting rid of some of the assessment requirements, third-party assessment requirements, it would yep. lower the cost specifically at level one. Um, as you're talking to folks about CMMC 2.0, does it seem like that worked? I mean, did 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 the changes the government announced actually address the challenges that you're hearing from those businesses? And, and, and is it, yeah, do they see it's better or worse under this new, new regime? It, you know, it still depends on how educated that particular supplier is, right? If there's somebody that's already got DFARS flow down clauses that are already working on their their poems for the system security plan and they've already made big investments. It's a big savings for them because they have a, a smaller amount to get uh, compliant with both DFARS, which they have now and CMMC 2.0. So that is a great benefit for the medium to companies that have been investing. But for smalls that haven't really invested at all, it's still a huge effort just to get, um, you know, NIST 171 to get the work done. That's It's much bigger than just the audit costs, which is minimal, municipal, I think I said that wrong, but it's a smaller cost than actually, you know, investing in your cybersecurity for an organization. So that's where I think the problem still is. How do they move the dial to get more secure to meet some of their current DFARS flowdown rules with, you yeah. know, 
a, a higher SPURS score that would make them, you know, at least demonstrate that they are lower risk and moving towards a 100% compliance. It's just the getting started and the initial investments and skill sets are still blocking people moving forward. I, so, I agree. Help I some, but not all. I, that, yeah, thanks. I agree. I think that, you know, there's always been an emphasis on the assessment cost, but ultimately I think the operations cost and finding efficient ways to do secure operations is, is that that's the, that's the cost that happens all, all day, right? Assessments yep. only once every three years, operations happens every day. Yep. So we think yeah, about get there. Get, getting there is kind of the, what they're worried about right now, but then they, then they're going to think about, well, how do I stay there? Right. Right. They're two different animals. And, you know, with the new regulations coming where there's ongoing monitoring, looking for the bad guys in your systems, that means you have a compliance program, you're updating your documentation, you do an annual risk assessment, doing regular penetration scans, because you got to stay compliant that costs investments. Um, it, it's a it's a program in itself to maintain your company's security and compliance posture. So you mentioned ransomware. I want to circle back a little bit on that. So one of the things that happened with CMMC 2.0 was we got rid of their requirements that were above and beyond the 800-171, right? So the Delta 20 that were in the, in, in the CMMC 1.0 um, got to things that 171 doesn't. 171, very focused on confidentiality of federal data. That's it, right? It's not, yep. it's not specifically trying to handle ransomware. It says that's right. a, a contractor responsibility. So... Um, you know, they pushed this, so the CMC 2.0 shifted that burden back to the companies instead of instead of the government prescribing it. Yep. So no longer required, but it's still certainly important to handle things like ransomware. As you're guiding companies, how do you how do you guide them to look at issues beyond sort of strict compliance, right? If they're still focused on their spur score being deficient, that's a must do. But yep. I would say ransomware is a must do for a totally different reason. What, yep. How do you balance that? How do you guide companies in that way? Yeah, I mean, this is where you you have to look at it from an enterprise, right? Because you can get whacked with ransomware, you know, anywhere through any sort of process or person or technology. Um, you can't just focus on the the scope of your defense data, right? Which is really what they the the government must protect is just their data, but there are other you know intellectual property, financial information that is just as valuable to that company because if that is attacked and held hostage, the financials, you can't run your company, right? So you have a bigger issue. And the more important thing that's starting to happen, and this is happening with Colonial Pipeline as we speak, is you know they got a ransomware attack, shut down their operations, their downstream suppliers were impacted financially. And so there is new legal cases that are coming into the court systems or tort law about Colonial Pipeline being negligent around their cybersecurity protection and therefore are liable to downstream people impacted. So it's a third party liability. And that's real dollars, right? Outside of just the impact of their credibility and you know, doing their, you know, being shut down for a day or two, this becomes impact to the entire suppliers and customers underneath them. That's when the money really gets big. Um, so that's the other trend that's going on. So you got ransomware just shutting down your business, your credibility, not being able to do your work. What do you do? You, you go back to paper. So, you, you know, while your systems are locked up, that's hard to do. So do you have a good backup plan to do the, uh, you know, manual processes like you used to? You've got, you know, the third party liability, right? People are going to start suing you because you didn't, you didn't do your due care, your due diligence. You basically are negligent that you didn't protect yeah, the supply and that affected them. And the third is that you have the business risk because if you don't demonstrate to the government that you're you're compliant, then you don't get contracts. So that's a business risk. So you have all those things working together now that are forcing the entire world, frankly, uh, uh, to raise the bar because there's so much new risk and so much liability that's coming into play. But the only thing that anybody can do is try to demonstrate due care and due diligence that they're doing a good job to protect their information and their customers' information from all these other things that will never be perfect because the bad guys are smart. And they're going to have these, but at least from a, a liability standpoint, you can demonstrate due care. Um, and all of those things are moving the bar up um, across the board. So, so Always a lot of focus on the div and what the div needs to do, but you mentioned some challenges there. Cost, certainly, number one, right? Um, yep. So shit, thinking about the role of industry, as you're talking to you know people like Microsoft, where you came from, you're talking to companies like ours, right? Mm -hmm. Talking to the, the folks in the industry that are bringing the solutions to the table, 
how do you how do you think we innovate to make security achievable? Like how do we address those 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 challenges you're seeing with your clients? Um, so yeah, I guess what's what's your advice to the the vendors of the world, the software providers, the software providers. and service providers for both product and services? Like for example, you're a service provider and you know, providing those the teams of people that that uh, they're not able, the other company's not able to find, or they don't want to accrue, don't want to have a career path on their own, and they don't want to invest there. They want to invest in new machinery, right? So they they have you come in as an expert with the right people to fill that gap, um, which is where most organizations are going in the cloud with people that are doing the operational work so they can stay focused on their business. So what I say is, you know, you've got, you got three roles out there. One is you're an advisor like I am trying to help them from a business standpoint, navigate all these things takes a lot of years of experience and hard knocks to know what's around the corner. Um, you got to stay up with the regulations. You got to look across the regulations, say, here's the right way to do it, that you you can create a single control, test it once and report it out to HIPAA or SOX or CMMC. So there's a, all that advisory and compliance, compliance and security sort of things. The second part is, is, you know, kind of the architecture. How do you have an architecture, technical architecture that is, really focus on data protection, ITAR, CUI, which is where you need a managed service provider that knows how to set up and configure it and protect it on behalf of the organization. Um, great new system does that well. And then the third one is you still have to be monitoring because you, you're not able to block everybody out all the time. So there are nefarious folks that come in through different uh, ways, ports, and then they start doing transactional sort of activities in there. So you got to monitor for that. But there's a lot of things going on there. So you need a lot of automation to do your monitoring and your SIM. And that's the third part of that. But uh, the one thing that is also important is have a penetration test and a vulnerability test up front on your current environments. Because you can't see this stuff. And this is the real problem with cybersecurity. We all have locks on our doors at our house. You know, we, we've, we know people that have been broken into and stolen stuff. So we're good at physical security. But how many of us know all the, the doors for cybersecurity that are coming into our house? We just know we have a connection to Comcast cable with a modem. Is it secure? Can people hack into that? I don't know, and I'm a professional. You can't see it, you can't touch it. So there's a lot of, um, I say, lack of understanding, education, and ability to demonstrate that you really are secure. That's why, so that's why I recommend a penetration of vulnerability test. It goes into the inside of your infrastructures and kind of checks for those things that aren't protected or a, a system admin changed the configuration setting that allowed a port to be open that now goes right into your financial databases. Those are things you just can't see. And it happens all the time through mistakes or they're not configured correctly. So having all of those things together, working together is a, a team, a village to protect the organization at the enterprise uh, and minimize the risk and again, it comes back to if you got a bear, you got a group of people in a bear's chasing you. Know, you just don't want to be the slowest guy, right? Because that's where the bear is going to get. They don't. Uh, same in the cybersecurity world. There, these criminals are looking for folks that um, aren't protecting themselves. They're not even doing their basic cyber hygiene. It's just easy to go in and take stuff. You know, you know, um, you know, encrypt their database. Now suddenly you got a ransomware attack just because they didn't close the door. I mean, it's kind of. Stupid, but we don't know unless we actually do those checks and balances and protect ourselves. But that's that's kind of the things I tell. I mean, there's four things that are really important for every company. One is have a good backup, right? So if you do get ransomware, you can still recover pretty quickly and test it. Second is you got multi-factor authentication. You just do that and that reduces a ton of people hacking your passwords and coming in. So that's a good one. You need endpoint protection. So you need all your, your laptops and endpoints and servers to be monitored and loaded into a SIM and then having automation of people look at those for um, nefarious activities. And fourth is the one that we, we all know about phishing. You need to educate your end users about phishing and you know emails that don't look right. So if you do those four things, you know, you're going to get cover, protect yourself from 80% of the, you know, the attacks that are going on today. There's still 20% for those advanced persistent threats that that have to deal with, but you need more sophisticated solutions and um, uh, more sophisticated solutions to help you through those things, which increases your costs. And that's what NIST 171 is 
doing some of that. But as you said, Ed, there are ransomware things outside of this 171 that companies need to do anyway. And I hate to say, you know, do an 853 set of baselines, but that's a heavy lift, but you are more protected. So that's like what's right for a particular company to yeah. protect themselves based on that investment. You mentioned penetration tests, right? This is something that's not strictly required at CMC level two, but still a lot of benefits for, for folks and a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons to do it, you know? Yes. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, for companies that are just starting out, right? So you mentioned, you know, check what you've already got, see how it's compliance. But for companies that are just starting out, they didn't design, they didn't build for government compliance, they certainly don't have it by accident, right? It just doesn't happen. So if they don't have any federal data today and they're just getting into the government contracting thing, what's your advice on how to kind of ease that entry and limit the upfront cost? You know, the security that we're talking about is an allowable cost after you win a contract, but obviously you got to you, you got to pass the bar before you can uh, before you can win that first one. So how do you ease that entry and limit upfront costs for security and compliance? Yeah, you know, I would recommend if you don't have an existing infrastructure, go cloud first. Um, Azure Gov, AWS Gov for your files, storage. Uh, look for, um, you know, secure based um, you know, information tools like Office 365, GCC High, or maybe Prevail. Things that are built for um, for government um, work, just go right to that. It's a little bit more expensive from a licensing standpoint because it's all supported by U.S. persons. But by transferring all of those requirements, if you're doing government work to a third party vendor like that, you don't have to do all of that investment yourself on physical infrastructure, hiring U.S. persons to patch. You know that that just gets costly, not only to find the people but to keep them employed and you know cybersecurity folks are getting really expensive and they're hard to find and hard to keep so doing that is probably the fastest path and it moves from a, a, a having to buy uh, capital capital assets like servers to more renting them in the cloud so you move from an operational so you can scale up and down from a operational cost uh, based on the demand of your, you know, the, the contracts that you're winning versus having to spend a lot of money up front to build a physical infrastructure. So I'd say cloud first, move as much and work in the cloud 100% and make sure you have the controls in place to protect the data when it's there. Like, you know, two-factor authentication, things like that, backups. You still need all of those sorts of things to protect yourself from, from adversaries. You, you mentioned sort of built for the cloud, you know, built for the government, right? And if you look at cloud providers, they have, you know, they, they use the word government in the name of the product. And you can and you can tell that that's designed for that government community specifically, right? It's GCC High from Microsoft, for example. Yep. It was designed for, for the government community. But uh, when you get to managed service providers, it's a lot harder to tell those apart. And I think, you know, right now, CMMC certification, nobody has it. It's not, it's not commercially available. But I think as it becomes commercially available, Presumably that helps sort of simplify the buying decisions, right? You start to see who is designed for government contractor community and who's not based on, you know, whether they've got that. I think it, yeah. I think it helps to sort the marketplace out a little bit. You know, speaking of the marketplace, I mean, there's probably 10,000 security and compliance tools out there, right? For the average company who's not in that space, they don't know where to begin or how to evaluate or have the time to go and select. And the DOD is not going to be prescriptive on here are solutions that will work for you. They just won't do that. They say, here are the requirements. Go figure it out yourself, industry or you know, supplier. And the CMMC AB team or the accreditation board is saying, hey, we're going to build uh, people that can assess and tr get trained uh, out there. But nobody's going to come up with you know, right size cost optimized solutions that companies can buy and select to fill those gaps, depending on where they're at in their security and compliance. Um, journey and their posture. So there is a uh, several industry leaders, uh, the Microsofts, AWS, Neo Systems, Cortex. They're trying to work together to build a credible set of solutions that companies can trust, um, and you know help vet out all of the I'll use the word snake oil salesmen that are out there selling. Hey, for five thousand dollars and buy our tool, we'll get you CMMC 2.0 compliant. I know customers that have bought that, and it's just it's horrible because it. It hurts every supplier out there like us that are trying to be rep respectable and reputable and you know men of integrity you know, or companies of integrity. So we're trying to figure out how to build that that ecosystem of companies that uh, suppliers can trust. Because 
DOD is not doing it. So industry has to step in and fill that gap. And that's, that's an exciting place to be. Um, and companies that want to come alongside and work with Cortec and Neosystem to do that uh, are welcome because that's what the industry is going to need to uh, move forward quickly with trust in uh, the industry suppliers like ourselves. Agreed. Hey, um, one of the, I'm going to wrap up, but one of the audience members is asking, you listed four things. Uh, number three was SIM. Number four was phishing. The audience members asking what were number one and two. So can you wrap yeah, up? Yeah, multi-factor authentication. Yep. Yeah, endpoint protection. So my wrap-up question was, uh, is, and, and maybe you just answered it, so number one action contractors can take today to improve effectiveness of their security effort. You know, they're putting out an effort, they're putting out some expense. How do they get the most? So is that, is that those four things, is that? Yeah, I mean, from a just purely mitigation standpoint, those are four of the high value return control areas. Now, if you don't know where, where you're at from a company, you need to really kind of assess yourselves either through a self-attestation using, you know, there's a lot of free tools out there to go through. Challenges, are you able to interpret the requirements and really understand what your organization is doing to really do a, a you know, a, a valid assessment versus what you think, right? So there's a lot of people that do self-assessments. We come in and say, hey, you know, you interpret this wrong. And so you're really not as good as you think you are, right? An auditor would whack you, you wouldn't pass. So you need to kind of go back and start from square one in these five areas. Um, so starting with some sort of assessment so you can make an informed decision on how to move forward and where to spend your, your limited resources to get the biggest bang for the buck to move forward in your, your security and compliance um, you know, posture and your journey going forward. And it's a never ending battle because you know things are changing all the time. You're gonna buy new technologies, you got new people coming in. So there's a lot of the education and continual and ongoing updates to documentation, to tools, to people. So, but you got to move forward and be transparent to the DOD because that's what they're looking for. For you today, everybody that has a DFARS slowdown has to have a SPUR score. Now that SPUR score can be between minus 300 and 110, 110 being the best. Now the law says it doesn't have to be better than 100 or you know 110 perfect. It just says you have to report, which is, um, meeting the legal and contractual requirements. So people just need to do that and be transparent because if you're transparent and something goes wrong, the DOD or the Department of Justice isn't gonna come back and say, hey, you said you had 110 score and we believed you, but you really didn't do your due diligence. You lied to the federal government. That's a false claims act. Now that's an ugly thing. So, and most defense industrial based folks are less than hundred. So you're not alone if you haven't really invested. People that are 110 that truly are have a competitive advantage, and that's the benefit of investing. Is you're a low risk provider and uh, a customer or an agency is like, wow, these guys are on top of their cybersecurity. I don't have to worry about them anymore. I trust them, so I'm going to give them all my business because they're protecting it for me, and I'm not going to get hit with a nation state attack and the, all the ramifications of that. Um, so yeah, those four, you know. Got to figure out where you're at so you can make informed decisions to, to navigate forward to where you want to go from an end, to, uh, an end point. I think, you know, the, uh, I want to emphasize your comment about sometimes people, if they misinterpret the requirements, might think they're closer to compliance than they really are. And that's bad because they're they're probably underestimating the level of effort and cost it's going to take to get them there. So if, if they think, hey, I'm, I'm already at 107 or whatever, then, you know, just two or three things to do. If that's accurate, that's great. But if it's not accurate, you're you're going to have some unexpected costs down the, down the pike when you have to stand in front of an auditor. So yeah, good then you don't have time to react right? later. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's really risky. So there's two types. One you can do, have somebody come in. If you really don't know, have somebody come in and fully assess you that you just pay them to do that. That can range from 20 to 50K, depending on how big your complex your organization is, how many interviews have to happen, how much documentation you have. Uh, but there are other ones where somebody's done a self-assessment or filled out that form and you get somebody coming in and just validate it and look at your documentation. It's more of an assurance so you can sleep better at night. Deal with three or four areas where you're not sure, depending on the, your, your maturity within your organization. So you can go with a, a kind of a quick review, but you know, nobody's going to stand behind it because they can't get into the details and say, yeah, this is right. But they can tell you it looks right. Or you go in and have somebody do the work and make sure that it is right. And then from there, you can say, all right, let's invest in multi-factor, let's invest in endpoint, let's invest in MSP, 
because those are our fastest path to mitigating these gaps to preserving the existing contracts as well as making it a competitive advantage for future DOD contracts as well as the federal government as they roll out CMMC to all federal agencies because they all want to protect their data and they don't only want one framework and that's going to be CMMC 2.0 because it's NIST based, it's already the law. And then that's it. it's going to roll out to critical infrastructure for public safety purposes, you know, electrical, electrical utilities, water utilities. They don't have uh, baselines out there. They have NERC FERC, but they don't have any cybersecurity. So what are they going to do? We already seen some, some hacks and uh, impacts to utilities that put people's lives at risk. And if a hospital needs electricity and people die because electricity is turned down because that utility didn't do their due care and due diligence, man, you can just see the liability that's going to come through this um, now that it becomes a current state of operations is protecting your infrastructure, both IT as well as OT. So lots, lots of things are going to be happening in the future that are going to drive behavioral change. Right now, the DOD has given us a chance to kind of ease our way into it. They've given us the time, but once they're done with rulemaking, you know, time's up, right? They'll give you a little bit of time, but they'll say, hey, you should have been here five years ago when we introduced DFARS. So you shouldn't have any additional work. We're just doing a third-party audit. The, the, you should have done this already drum has been definitely, um, the DOD has been beating that drum for sure. I did, oh, I, by the way, for folks in the audience, I did manage to post in the chat window, the uh, information on the DOD CIO town hall it's tomorrow morning so if you want to check that out to see what the government's doing uh, to assist then that's a good good resource um jerry thanks very much for joining us today it was some really good insight appreciate it thank you wade for for capturing this in your in your sketch um for the audience members thanks for your time attention questions you sent in please join us for future town hall meetings our next session is going to be a week from today wednesday march 2nd at our regular time of 1 p.m eastern if you don't have the invitation and, and details to register in your inbox, then go to our website, neosystemscorp.com, where you can find all the details. Thanks very much. Thanks all.